This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. The obstinate defenders of the Vatican II antipopes are similar to the idolatrous king mentioned in Daniel chapter 14. The king worshipped the false god Bel. The false traditionalists and other members of the Novus Ordo sadly become idolaters like the worshippers of the false god Bel by ignoring the fact that antipope Francis is a heretic who denies Catholic dogmas. Francis accepts Judaism, teaches that Protestants and schismatics are in the church, and much more. Those irrefutable facts about Antipope Francis's heresies and his open embrace of Christ's denial don't cause the false traditionalists or other members of the Novus Ordo I'm referring to to reject Francis as a heretic as the facts should. On the contrary, they fully accept him despite knowing about these facts, and on any occasion that Francis might say or do anything which happens to be consistent with Catholic teaching, they will proclaim it from the housetops as if it's some tremendous victory, they will announce and promote it with triumphant glee, as if it proves that he has the Catholic faith or opposes evil, as if a documented heretic who accepts false religions somehow becomes a legitimate Catholic because he occasionally says something true or Catholic. It's absurd and it's disgraceful, but it reminds me of the story in Daniel chapter 14 concerning the king and the false god Bel. Daniel was the guest of King Cyrus, king of the Babylonians. Daniel adored the Lord God but the king and the Babylonians adored the false god and idol, Bel. We read in Daniel 14.3 that the king asked Daniel why he doesn't adore Bel. Daniel responded by saying that he doesn't worship idols made with hands, but the living God who created heaven and earth. In a similar way, a true Catholic, when questioned why he doesn't acknowledge anti-Pope Francis to be the Pope, would explain that he cannot regard a heretic, a person clearly devoid of the Catholic faith, as a Pope for such a person lacks the attributes of a true pope, just as an idol lacks the attributes of the living God. The king responded to Daniel's statement that he doesn't worship idols made with hands but the living God by saying, quote, You do not think Bel is a living God? Do you not see how much he eats and drinks each day? End quote. As part of the cult of Bel, the Babylonians would set out food and drink for the idol each day. The king was thus saying to Daniel, doesn't Bell exhibit the signs of life? Doesn't he eat and doesn't he drink? In response, Daniel smiled and said, quote, Do not be deceived, O king. It, Bell, is only clay inside and bronze outside. It has never eaten or drunk anything. End quote. Daniel was telling the king that Bell is not alive. It's just an idol which lacks the attributes of the living God, just as anti Pope Francis lacks the attributes of a Catholic Pope. The king was enraged by Daniel's words, so he called for the priests of Bel. He told them that if they don't tell him who consumes the food and drink that is set up for Bel each day, they shall die. But if they can show that Bel indeed eats the food and consumes the drink that is prepared for him, Daniel shall die for having blasphemed Bel. So a test was arranged. Food and wine would be left for Bel as usual, but the door would be closed and sealed with the king's own ring. The priests of Bel, however, knew that the whole thing was a fraud. They knew Bel didn't eat or drink anything. They had secret doors by which they would enter the temple of Bel and consume the food and the wine to give the appearance to the king and others that Bel had consumed the provisions. So when the king entered the temple of Bel the next morning, he first asked Daniel if the seals had been broken. In other words, if anyone had entered by that door, Daniel responded by saying, They are unbroken, O king. And the king, Seeing that Bell's table did not have food and drink, and believing that Bell had consumed the provisions set out for him, cried out, quote, You are great, O Bell. There is no deceit in thee. End quote. One can see how much the idolatrous king wanted to believe the lie. He ignored all of the signs that Bell is not the living God, that he is just the work of human hands, and he was desperately searching for any reason to believe in the fraud. In his bad will and deceitful heart, he jumped at any evidence he could find to accept the idol, for while resisting the living God, he nevertheless wanted some God in front of him he could follow in worship, just like the false traditionalists and false conservatives and other members of the Novus Ordo, ignoring all of the irrefutable facts which prove that anti-Pope Francis is a heretic devoid of the Catholic faith, search land and sea for any reason to consider him a Catholic, for they pine for a live body dressed up in robes they can follow no matter how many heresies he's on record as having promoted. Hence, they will sickeningly promote anything at all he says or does that happens to be true, 
as if a true statement or action here or there could somehow remedy the fatal defects of his apostasy, when of course it could not. So when the king cried out, You are great, O Bel, there is no deceit in thee, similar to how the false traditionalists dishonestly cry out, You are Catholic, O Francis, there is no heresy in thee, Daniel laughed and said to the king, quote, Look at the floor and consider whose footprints these are. End quote. Daniel showed the king the footprints of the priests of Bel, for they would enter in through private doors and consume the food and drink that had been left for Bel. Their footprints were clearly visible because Daniel had spread ashes throughout the temple. Daniel showed the king that Bel was just a fraud, just as true Catholics show the false traditionalists the prints or evidence of anti-Pope Francis's apostasy, and that he's just a fraud. Make no mistake about it, the false traditionalists and other members of the Novus Ordo in our day who obstinately defend and promote anti-Pope Francis in the face of the evidence, are idolaters, just as the king was before his eventual conversion. Examples of these heretical idolaters in our day would be Michael Voris, the remnant, Nicholas Gruner, and Rorate Celli, but there are many, many others. Despite anti-Pope Francis's documented false ecumenism, his interreligious apostasy, his open acceptance of heretics and schismatics, his complete failure to discipline the most public heretics in the counterchurch, such as pro-abortionists, if he ever says anything they deem conservative or strong, which is actually never strong at all, they will say things such as, quote, Pope Francis is such a bomb thrower, or, quote, Viva il Papa. They are beyond pathetic. In defending the clearly heretical Vatican II sect at all costs, in a futile attempt to make a Catholic out of the man currently in Rome, simply because they must have a live body to follow at all times, even if he denies the substance of the faith, they have reached the point of idolatry. They ignore his many faith-denying heresies and look for any reason or pretext they can find to regard this fraud as a Catholic. Since many heretics in our day have spent years tolerating, ignoring, and defending the heresies of the antipopes, they have become desensitized to the significance of the faith issues. So to illustrate this point, let's approach this from a different angle. Hopefully this analogy will assist some of them in seeing that their promotion of Francis, on the occasions he says something that tickles their ears, is pure evil. Suppose that a married man named Jorge publicly and openly commits adultery with numerous women. His adultery is documented by the fact that he openly lodges with these women, and both he and the women comment on their relationship. Now this same married man, Jorge, who everyone knows commits adultery with numerous women during the week, will show up consistently at Catholic Church on Sunday. He will dress appropriately, participate ardently, conduct himself apparently piously, and he will pray with external devotion. In fact, spending extra time after the service, Jorge will often give an apparently heartfelt talk about the importance of adhering to Catholic morality, Catholic teaching, and practicing devotion to Mary. But everyone knows that Jorge is a fraud. They know about his documented adultery with numerous women, and the fact that he sometimes pretends to be a devout Catholic because he says or does certain things a Catholic would do. How evil would it be for Catholic observers of Jorge on the occasions when he does give a Catholic talk or act like a Catholic to publicly promote Jorge as if he's a good person or an exemplar of Catholic devotion and morality? It would be pure evil, for it would give the impression that adultery is compatible with Catholic morality or a godly lifestyle. It would mean that an adulterer is someone we should hold up as a Catholic example, as long as the adulterer sometimes says or does Catholic things. Those who promote this adulterer, Jorge, as a good Catholic example, would be directly assisting the devil and perpetuating a fraud, for they would be conflating sin with holiness, adultery with morality, debauchery with edifying spirituality. That is evil. And that is exactly what the false traditionalists and false conservatives do every single time they promote the wicked anti-Pope Francis, or give the impression that he's conservative if he says something they deem conservative. For they know for a fact, as anyone who cares can find out, that he fully endorses false religions, condemned false ecumenism, heretical sects, praying with the leaders of heretical sects, and apostate interreligious activity. That's a fact. By ignoring those facts, or even acknowledging those facts, but promoting him anyway as if he's a staunch Catholic, or as if he adheres to Catholic teaching because, on a rare occasion, he says something conservative, is no different from promoting a known adulterer named Jorge as a model of piety, 
simply because he engages in externally devout activities on Sunday. People who love our Lord and Our Lady would never want to promote such a man as good or Catholic, because they would know that by doing so, they would be giving a false impression about an evil person. Perhaps this consideration might help some of them see that in promoting Francis in any way, rather than denouncing him as they should, they do the work of the devil and they are on the side of the devil. They give the impression that false ecumenism, etc. is compatible with staunch adherence to the Catholic faith. In fact, they even equate the devil with Our Lady, for many of these false traditionalists will give the impression that Francis is truly devoted to Our Lady, despite his false ecumenism, his complete failure to discipline the counter-church, his tolerance of liturgical evils, pro-abortionists receiving, quote, communion, etc. They thus imply that true devotion to Our Lady is compatible with endorsement of evil religions, false ecumenism, lax leadership, etc., they thus equate Our Lady with Satan. That's what they do every single time they promote the wicked anti-Pope Francis in any way, as if he's a Catholic or conservative. And when they do promote something he says which they consider to be conservative, it's never nearly as conservative as they portray it, and it's always exaggerated. For example, false traditionalists went bonkers over the fact that Francis made this bland statement. Quoting anti-Pope Paul VI, he said, quote, It's an absurd dichotomy to think one can live with Jesus but without the church to follow Jesus outside the church, to love Jesus and not the church, end quote. In light of this statement, many false traditionalists essentially proclaimed, Great art thou, O Francis, there is no heresy in thee. They implied that he actually believes the church is necessary. No, not at all. Even this statement does not mean that true followers of Jesus should or must adhere to the Catholic Church. For Francis holds, as Vatican II teaches in its Decree on Ecumenism, that Protestants and schismatics are in the church. Francis holds that every Protestant and, quote, orthodox schismatic who claims to believe in Jesus and has been baptized is part of the church of Christ. None of those people can be accused of heresy or the sin of separation, as Vatican II teaches. So, of course, he would hold that you cannot follow Jesus outside the church, for all the baptized members of Protestant and, quote, orthodox sects are in the church, according to him. He doesn't say that you cannot follow Jesus as a non-Catholic, or as a Protestant, or as a, quote, Orthodox. He doesn't say you cannot follow Jesus outside the Roman Catholic Church. No, he says you cannot follow Jesus outside the Church, and the Protestants and Schismatics are part of the Church, according to him. Indeed, he endorses and prays with people who claim to follow Jesus who are not Catholic. He also does not say in this statement that you cannot be saved if you don't believe in Jesus, for he doesn't believe that. He holds that the Jews have been delivered from all evil, that they adhere to a valid religion, and that they don't need conversion. That's a fact. His representative recently taught the same thing. His statement is nothing more than a bland utterance that comes from anti-Pope Paul VI, the same man who said that Islam is a religion that binds people to God, and that Protestants and schismatics shouldn't be proselytized. And even if Francis made a statement which was totally strong and clear, which he didn't, it wouldn't change the fact that he's a fraud. Pope Pius VI pointed out that manifest heretics typically contradict themselves or make true statements in the midst of teaching their heresies. And he made it clear that if heretics sometimes say things that are true or even contradict their heresies, that does not excuse the fact that they are heretics and they must be held to their heresies. And there are many other examples of Francis's heresies. He's a documented heretic and apostate. Nevertheless, the false traditionalists, ignoring the truth and looking for any way to defend or promote the live body dressed up in robes who is currently in Rome, proclaim, Great art thou, O Francis, there is no heresy in thee. They are disgusting, and God abominates them. Some of them will even go so far as to praise and emphasize that someone was refused, quote, communion in the hand at one of Francis' services. If that is true, so what? It's a fact that Francis has given, quote, communion in the hand many times, and that he currently allows it all over the Vatican II sect. So even though he approves, quote, communion in the hand, if one person happens to be refused it at one of his services, they will proclaim, Great art thou, O Francis, there is no heresy in thee. And even if Francis completely opposed, quote, communion in the hand, who cares? It would make no difference. He is just heresy within and apostasy without. There is no Catholicism in him. The guy fully accepts Judaism and denies Catholic dogmas. That's a fact. But according to them, if you just dress up in robes and refuse someone, quote, communion in the hand once in a while, or make a conservative statement on occasion, 
you can be considered and promoted as a Catholic and a Pope no matter what else you do. That's how pathetic these people are. It's sickening. Their apostasy is analogous to the idolatry of the king. They are searching for any, even the smallest pretext, to regard a clear fraud as legitimate, and they blind themselves to the irrefutable facts and indications that he's not a Catholic.